We're just trying to reconnect with Bhavna for a moment. She's dropped out again. We will be starting very soon. Sure, save sounds good. Well, welcome everybody to session three. <clears throat> and it's good to see some interest from other countries outside India as well, uh, in particular Nepal and Myanmar. And I just saw a delegate name pop up who's a good friend of mine who works with Marcia from the US. That's from the US, not in the US. So it's good to see there's spreading interest in the work that we're doing. Yesterday we had a fantastic session on aquatic plants and insects. And that was the first of our multi-speaker webinars. 
And our experts gave us an insight into the complex interactions between insects and plants and how they use waterways. But they also told us about the cultural value of plants and how important insects can be as bioindicators. Today, we have three brilliant young scientists lined up for you. And I have to say, I've worked with all three of these across various platforms. So I'm certainly looking forward to hearing them all speak. We'll be looking at the links between fish and river connectivity. But we have to remember that the background to these webinar sessions is the publication last week of WWF's Freshwater Living Planet Index. So Aria, our first speaker, can you tell us a little bit more about what the implications are for these troubling or from these troubling biodiversity reports? Over to you. Okay, uh, hello Steve. So uh, the living, I would like to talk uh, something about Living Planet Index first. So Living Planet uh, report is WWF's uh, flagship publication released every two years. Uh, and it's a comprehensive uh, study of uh, trends in global biodiversity uh, and the health of the planet. So um, can I share my presentation? You mute. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, do you want to share your presentation? Yeah, because yeah. You, you know I, when I, to change slides, yes. So, um, should I share the screen now? Yeah, carry on, yes. There you go. Can you see that? Is it visible now? It yes, is. it is. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the Freshwater Living Planet Index is, uh, as I told you, is a measure of uh, the state of world's uh, biological diversity, and uh, which is based on the population trend of uh, vertebrate species, which is terrestrial, that's both marine and freshwater. So now we have the uh, uh, graph before us. And it, uh, it, as you can see, the uh, graph is declining. And you can see there my 84 percentage is the uh, decline in uh, the, uh, the overall, uh, uh, the uh, index or the, the overall uh, decline in uh, the uh, uh, what population of uh, freshwater uh, fish uh, across the world. So uh, freshwater biodiversity is uh, declining with far faster than uh, the um, ocean or the forest for that matter. But so uh, one among every three uh, freshwater species are threatened and almost all the taxonomy groups are uh, facing this uh, um, higher risk of extension. extinction. So uh, average uh, abundance of freshwater population, uh, like how I've, see, I've shown here, monitored across the globe has steeply declined to 84%. So, which is very alarming. So, uh, what are the reasons? Why, why, why is it uh, declining in a very alarming rate? So, one of the reasons is this: out of mind is out of sight. So, uh, as we 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 know we know as as uh, we don't look into as long as we don't look uh, beneath these freshwater ecosystems, what lies beneath them, how important these are, we can never understand. What, what causes the decline and uh, what causes the huge uh, steep in the graph that I've shown now. So uh, for that, I'll tell you something, uh, how uh, diverse is freshwater ecosystems? As you can see here, they range from minions to giants. So on my right, I have a very small uh, dwarf puffer fish. And on the right, I have a, a huge arapaima, which is native to uh, Amazon River Basin. So as you can see, there is a huge uh, range of uh, size uh, which we have in freshwater ecosystems. So uh, th there's something else about this dwarf puffer, OK? Uh, I don't know how many of you have watched the movie Finding Nemo. So in Finding Nemo, you have uh, a bloat 
uh, blowfish, and uh, that is a dwarf puffer fish, and it it is endemic to uh, Western Ghats, and it is endemic to Kerala also. So, uh, though, so that character is Carinotetrodon travancoricus. So <laughs> that's a new, that would be interesting for at least some of you because, uh, and uh, even that movie you can see that almost all are marine fishes. Only just a couple. I can just spot out only one or two, which. Uh, which will uh, show you how underrated and overlooked are uh, freshwater ecosystems. And now, uh, another very interesting fish is Danionella dracula. So you will be wondering why the name dracula. So on the right, you can see the stem image that is scanning electron microscope image of uh, Danionella dracula. So uh, you can see all those fangs, right? <laughs> so now, now you can just understand why it is called a Dracula fish. So there is something very unusual about this fish, okay? The male uh, Dracula fish is uh, actually had a lot, the ancestors lost the tooth, the true tooth, and about like say 50 million years ago. And uh, uh, they re-evolved to have these uh, fangs, like bone, which stem from their jaw bones. They're actually bones, but they look like fangs. So they re-evolved after say 30 million years ago. So, which is very unusual. So when you see the same uh, image, you can, you look, they look like the fangs of a dracula, hence the name dracula fish. So I'm showing these photographs so that uh, 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 the people who see this should understand how, how, uh, how amazing and how wonderful is freshwater ecosystems. And another uh, very uh, interesting uh, species is the Pedocypress progenetica. Yeah? So uh, as uh, when it was described, uh, when it was discovered, it was already there when it was described uh, years back, it was the world's uh, smallest vertebrate, okay? Now, if event uh, eventually after the description of these Pedocypress progenetica, yeah, we, uh, we got a, in a smaller fish, smaller than this okay this is the smallest and smaller than this there was a marine uh, fish and we have a frog which is smaller than this so you might be wondering i'm insisting the word small small again and again so you would be asking how small so this small is the fish uh, this small is uh, um, the fish that i was talking about and uh, you uh, the adult fish uh, this is not a juvenile fish okay this is not a small uh, offspring uh, young young uh, or this is not a, a juvenile form it is a fully mature adult form female specimen that's what this is and you it, it, this is just like oh, how uh, i i think it's just 7.9 uh, millimeter uh, in length so it is very small and where it is found is even more interesting it is found in the peat swamps peat swamps is a kind of habitat that i've shown on the right so these habitats are very unique and they're very highly acidic habitats so these uh, were found from very unexpected habitats like these and uh, from th this was actually described from uh, indonesian uh, island of sumatra and now they have almost a distribution across the sumatra and uh, i think uh, binton islands also so uh, so I, as you can see now this is how uh, uh, different uh, kind of uh, species that you can find in a freshwater ecosystem. And uh, now moving on to, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, divide the freshwater ecosystem into three different zones just to understand the habitat or the, uh, the velocity according to the their velocity. I'm sure the upcoming talks will, they will be talking about this in detail, but just to give a glance uh, to you. Uh, so the uh, when you see that there is a small, uh, we have a um, deposition zone where it is a very low slope and they open to the mouth of oceans. Uh, so they are wide. And as you can read, they are the most of the sediments uh, come there and they have their the, uh, deposited in the zone and they're very wide and they open to oceans. And then you have a small uh, transition zone in between where uh, you, it is higher altitude than the uh, deposition zone, but they will have a slower velocity, but they will have a larger uh, riverbed and there will be erosion and deposition processes. But what I'm dealing with is the headwaters the source zone 
this is what this i could tell you that these are uh, hill streams or mountains from where the uh, uh, the rivers actually originate so obviously since they have very high altitude there there are steep slopes they are fast velocity they, the streams will the water will be in very high velocity and there will be large size sediments also so uh, when you you can have a look at the the photograph that i've just shown now so one will be wondering what kind of uh, fishes will be found in these kind of amazing uh, fast flowing uh, habitats fast flowing rivers okay now i'll show you another pic this is bhavani australis so now i will tell you behold bhavani australis this is my uh, i this is very close to my heart because i am doing my phd on uh, molecular ecology of uh, balatorids so i'll tell you what a balatorid is balatorid are a group uh, of fishes under family balatoridae okay now uh, bhavani australis is one among uh, the balatorids okay and now Uh, as you can see here there is a riffle there a riffle uh, is a, a kind of uh, fast flowing shallow bottom streams uh, where i am sitting so <laughs> these kind of habitats are where you can find uh, these beautiful amazing organisms they actually stick on to the rocks against the flow okay so that's how they sit and they have uh, they eat small algae and uh, ripe parent vegetations so uh, so that's what the, these balatorids are uh, specific to hill stream uh, hill stream habitats they are having a very micro habitat uh, specific adaptations also for uh, thriving in these kind of environments so as you can see now there you can see a lot of fishes here these are all freshwater small fishes which uh, occur in the uh, the segments that i've shown right now the hill streams and you have uh, even seen the transition zone so uh, these baltora latifuda is uh, actually baltore and then you have a lot of nemaculates there is indorionectes there is botia so botia is uh, have uh, is occurs in the transition zone that i've shown you before so the these are wide ranging uh, organisms which uh, found, which are found across these uh, zones that i've shown you before but you might one you will be really thinking about why they are very uh, they don't look so happy they don't look so attractive to you but have a look at this this is a bhavani again which is in its uh, natural habitat so uh, now you know why i was telling you that freshwater ecosystem is <laughs> is overlooked and underrated because when you look at these habitats you will be amazed because they are really uh, beautiful habitats down there you just need someone to look down <laughs> on them uh, okay now i would like to quote uh, prashant chakrabarty uh, uh, a person who, who i listened to uh, on a ted talk recently so he was telling uh, fishes are our actual ancestors so we think that uh, uh, monkeys are our ancestors or uh, apes are our ancestors but no actually if you think fishes are the first vertebrates so technically fishes are our ancestors <laughs> so uh, there you can see bhavani again uh, sorry for putting bhavani again and again but I, i this is an analysis that we have run and we found that bhavani uh, evolved 30 million years ago can you imagine 30 million years ago when you when i say 30 million ago, years ago you have to imagine that these fishes lived with the animals of uh, jurassic era okay so they have they are way before we evolved okay so we are technically uh, like successors and uh, the fishes are our original ancestors so so now you know fishes are really important <laughs> now moving on uh, i told about told you about the baltorids right so these are specialized group of freshwater fishes which are actually colonized uh, the torrential hill streams of south southeast asia and to the far east so something uh, uh, i've been telling uh, that they are sitting on these uh, rocks against the flow so what makes them uh, adapted to that habitat it's because of their anatomy just if you have a look at the anatomy i've showed there is a small picture there there are all these adhesion devices across them which make them 
uh, capable of uh, sticking onto these rocks against the flow of water okay they they don't they have to move up against the flow of the water and all this, they you can see that there is there is a picture on the uh, right down you can see that there is a red color marked areas of a fish those are all adhesive devices they are not just on their mouth but they are across their body uh, which which are there in their pectoral fins they are there in the pelvic fins they are all over the body they are on their head so that they can stick to the these strong flows and they can feed on the algae and other riparian vegetation which are there on these rocks okay now this is a very interesting stuff this is waterfall climber so if you just there was a video i don't know how many of you have seen of these uh, this fish climbing a, a road i don't know if you have seen this so if you uh, these uh, there are these fishes are really um, uh, very peculiar one i'll tell you the name of this fish this is uh, cryptotora tamicola so these the, these waterfall climbers actually use their uh, fins so as you can see there there is a ct image of that girdle okay the uh, pectoral or the pelvic girdle those fins those fishes use those fins as like uh, legs to walk technically walk but they usually climb all those uh, waterfalls using all these fins you can you can google it it's an amazing video of how they walk up so so that's why again that's why i told you the fishes are our ancestors <laughs> now uh, i have been talking about loaches small fishes about uh, their ecological uh, preferences their habitats so apart from all these loaches have a very a very integral part in the food and uh, nutrition security be it rich or poor we need calcium as a source of uh, uh, the nutrient as an intake uh, so what uh, these small fishes like loaches and other uh, uh small fishes which live uh, in these ecosystems freshwater ecosystems are used by tribal people or uh, the indigenous people there as a source of uh, food and nutrition so as you can see there are a lot of uh, uh, publications regarding about how these small fishes are used as fishes uh, as uh, food now uh, this is one importance as a as how important they are as a source of food but then there is another important important uh, use or uh, the uh, uh, how they are important in the uh, food web so as you can see there in the trophic i've uh, there is a small image showing the trophic level there is a small uh, fresh water food web there so i told you these fishes are uh, sticking on the rocks and they are feeding on these algal uh, uh, algae that is Uh, found uh, in the surface of those rocks so uh, these uh, algae are been eaten by these small fishes and they again are being fed by large fishes so now you understand these fishes how they connect the food web and how important are these in the uh, when you look in a uh, bigger picture of a food web and also uh, people who for the aesthetics i would say the people who uh, love to keep fish as pets as an aquarium uh, uh, hobby loaches are being transported across the world for uh, as uh, aquarium pets fishes uh, so that's another importance of uh, small fishes not just the habitat they, they also um, uh, go to aesthetics uh, i would say i mean they are very important in that sense also so as my first slide said we are living on the edge every impact be direct or indirect uh, uh impact of human or for that matter any any issue that happens in the environment directly or indirectly affects the eco uh, the freshwater ecosystem so you can see that there is a lot of uh, factors over exploitation water pollution habitat degradation species invasion and all these are uh, interacting together and overarching the climate uh, change so climate change is like a push uh, to all these factors all the is issues that i've been discussing in these um, uh, the slide directly or indirectly affect the freshwater ecosystems 
So I am just uh, pointing out a few of the issues that I see in Western Ghats because uh, first one is sand mining. Sand mining. There are fishes like uh, gobi, gobi fishes, which are sand loving uh, fishes. So once you uh, mine uh, sand off these riverbeds, they are uh, left with nothing. So they can't uh, survive in mud. Uh, they can't survive in any other habitats. So once you remove the uh, sand from these uh, rivers, you not only kill the river as such, but you are killing the whole ecosystem beneath these uh, rivers. That's one thing. Second one, you can see that there are a lot of boulders uh, uh, on the right bottom. You can see that boulders are being uh, taken out of uh, the large rivers. Of these, these, uh, this photo is from Himalayas. So the, uh, I have told you, uh, my, these kind of small fishes are usually very shy and they uh, inhabit in uh, behind, beneath these large rocks, small rocks. They need pebbles, cobbles, and large fishes like boulders. So when you remove these boulders, eventually, what I told you, the whole ecosystem is just get vanished and uh, those uh, fishes uh, will have, eventually they will, um, they will ex they will get extinct. I don't say that they will get extinct, but uh, those fishes will uh, eventually um, uh, vanish from such ecosystems. Another one is that uh, you can see a plantation over there. Almost Western Ghats, a huge. Uh, I wouldn't say a huge, but many parts of the Western Ghats are actually uh, tran um, transferred as plantations. So these plantations, uh, yeah, for tea and cardamom plantations, they obviously will be using pesticides. So these pesticides eventually run off to waters. Like as how I said, all the effects eventually runs down to rivers. So they, they these pesticides uh, run wash off to rivers and which will, uh, which will eventually affect the fishes like how I've shown there. Now, fishing practices. The tribal people usually have a very uh, a very old uh, fishing practice where they use poisons to kill fishes. And on the right, you can see uh, dynamite, use of dynamites for uh, uh, killing the fishes. Either way, they're very, very uh, disastrous to the environment as such. And they not only kill the fishes, but they uh, kill all other uh, flora and fauna which is present in the ecosystem. So uh, when they're using dynamites, uh, th th that is not only really, uh, disastrous to the ecosystem. I've seen there are uh, visuals of people who have lost their hands. They get amputated when they are throwing these dynamites to that uh, uh, these uh, rivers. So it's uh, it's it's really disastrous, and I would say it is barbaric. So these kind of uh, um, disastrous and um, very uh, crude methods of uh, getting fishes eventually affect our freshwater ecosystems. I would like to conclude by saying that about one third of rivers, which are less than thousand kilometers in its stretch and almost 56%, that is almost half of all the free flowing uh, rivers over their entire length. I would say that they are never, uh, they, do, they are not dammed in between, they don't have any barriers in between. So uh, it is alarming to see that only 37% of the rivers, which is less than 1000 kilometers are free flowing across its length, right from its uh, source until they uh, join the ocean. So the, it is huge. Uh, it is really alarming to see that uh, the all those uh, habitats are being dammed and once they are having a barriers in between, all the specific habitats that I've been talking about uh, vanishes. So those fishes will eventually perish from these kind of habitats. So that's it, I would say. <laughs> Thank you, Arya. That's fantastic. I have a, a couple of comments to make, actually, based on what you've been saying. Um, when we looked at what you called the world's tiniest fish, the uh, Pedocypris progenetica, yeah. but you said this yeah. is no longer the world's smallest fish, is that correct? Yes, that is another marine fish. <laughs> right, so it's been overtaken, which leads me to say, I know, but maybe not everybody knows, that you are studying at KUFOS under Rajiv Raghavan, yeah. and that lab in particular 
Rajiv's organization, the, the work that you're doing there, you're discovering new fish all the time, especially in the Western Ghats. Yes. So this is a, a really important lesson that yeah. you said right at the beginning that we don't look below the water, so we don't know the troubles faced by the fish. One of the big troubles is we still don't exactly know what fish are there. Exactly. Yeah, so thank you very much. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'll just say uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a few messages coming in on the chat bar already, and especially people saying thank you, Aria. Fantastic presentation. So if anybody has any questions, drop them into the chat bar there. Anuja is monitoring what goes into the chat bar. And if we have time at the end, we'll answer all the questions that we can in the time remaining. So Aria finished there her final slide. I don't know if you want to stop your screen sharing now. Thank you. Yeah, but I was just, I'm just feeling okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I? And we were looking about we were looking at the links between biodiversity loss and the loss of free flowing rivers, which is quite an important uh, situation. It's a, a troubling situation that we face. So we need to look look at exactly what is a free-flowing river. We need to make these links between biodiversity and free-flowing rivers and luckily we have a river connectivity expert with us. So it's down for me now to ask Surabi, can you explain to us what is good habitat and why is a free-flowing river important to good habitat? Yeah, sure Steve. Thank you Arya for the presentation. Um, I'll share my screen now. Um, yeah, so as Arya was mentioning in her presentation that uh, free flowing rivers have become rare with only 37% of them remaining globally. So let's see how, why frequent rivers are important to us. On your screen, you can see a summary of ecosystem services provided by frequent rivers. They provide us with fresh water, recharge groundwater reserves, create fertile floodplains, transfer sediments from upstream to downstream location, creating fertile delta. They also offer recreation opportunity and are of spiritual relevance to many people. And rivers with high connectivity are among the most important freshwater habitats where vulnerable species thrive and adapt to climate change. So, um, so it's capac the capacity of rivers to flow freely is governed by the connectivity to riverine ecosystems like floodplain, uh, river channel, riparian zones, lakes, and wetlands, depending on its natural flow regime. So let's have a look at the river connectivity. It basically extends in four dimensions, longitudinal, lateral, vertical, and temporal. Longitudinal mainly relates to upstream and downstream connection in the river channel due to river flow. And lateral is basically the connection between the main channel and the floodplain areas and riparian areas whenever the river swells. The vertical uh, dimension is basically between vertical connections between the, the groundwater and the river, and also the atmospheric moisture, which is recirculated because of precipitation or evapotranspiration. And then we have temporal um, connectivity due to seasonality of flows. So um, together, uh, these uh, dimensions are regulated because of the natural uh, flow variability of a river. And this natural flow variability results from changing precipitation and evapotranspiration patterns associated with the land use, climate, and land surface water balance. But increasingly, this natural flow variability um, to which aquatic species are accustomed to is getting disrupted by man-made sources of flow alteration. So on the right, you have a picture of Kaveri River, and you can see here is a dam, which is obstructing the river flow. The orange portion in this uh, satellite imagery is the, is the water stressed area, and the blue portion is the water rich area. So you can see how the river flow is getting impounded by the artificial uh, diversion. 
and uh, and because of these dams the a lot of flood plains are converted into agricultural uh, uh, uh agricultural lands where farmers end up growing uh, water intensive crops like sugarcane and paddy which intense uh, uh which uh, which leads to increase extraction of groundwater reserve and uh, that also uh, uh, that also like leads to flow alteration because the base flow to the base flow in the river declines because of uh, increased extraction of groundwater so this also urbanization of floodplain areas reduces groundwater recharge and increasing surface runoff in, um, which increases the chances of flooding and interplay of all these uh, factors impact the water quality nutrient supply and population of freshwater diversity in a river basin so because of these alterations what are the there are there, there is a significant impact on the freshwater biodiversity which is there in the river basin so there there was a meta analysis of lot of papers around 165 papers and it was found that fish fishes consistently responded negatively to changes in flow magnitude and also there was a large decline in species richness whenever the flow of alteration exceeded 50% thus we really need to um, restore the natural regime of the river and provide water for environment in order for these species to thrive and then next we move on to environmental flows so as many of you must be aware of like um, the environmental flows they form the link between ecological uh, health or ecosystem integrity of a river basin and the ecosystem services which we derive from it and so there are different uh, factors which determine the ecological health of a river basin like connectivity the biological components the water quality the geomorphology and the hydrology the um, it the environmental flows is such that it mimics the natural flow regime and balances the water needs of society and environment resulting in healthier watersheds and healthier communities so recently in 2018 brisbane declared in brisbane declaration it was defined that environmental flows uh, describe the quantity quality time quantity timing and quality of fresh water flows and level, levels necessary to sustain aquatic ecosystem which in turn support human cultures economy sustainable livelihoods and well-being um currently in india only three pilot studies are going on um which for eflow assessment but um like none of these extensive environmental flow assessments have happened for most of the rivers in india and uh, because of mainly because of lack of data we don't have uh, like most of the dams in india were built uh, early on um and during the 1960s or 70s well before uh, the date the natural the river flow data was collected by uh authorities like central water commission so because of this lack of data uh this environmental flow assessment has not been um completed in india and also there is a lack of uh research in this uh, aspect so let's we uh, i want to like uh, draw your attention towards my study area um so i looked into kaveri river basin and tried to uh, do a preliminary assessment of ecosystem integrity of kaveri river basin so um i they, this is the these are the reservoirs in kaveri river basin and if you look at the uh, uh the these uh, the spatial representation the reservoirs are uh, represented according to their size related to their size so most of the reservoirs are basic, basically small size reservoirs which are which were built early on in nine, during 1960s or 70s and they are still existing and these are hampering the flow of a uh, lot of tributaries and sub tributaries of kaveri river basin and uh, so uh, the thing is um, none of the eflow assessments for these uh, dams were not done and uh, because of which the eco the the riverine ecosystem was altered uh, totally and so kaveri is a heavily degraded uh, river basin and um, and because of this um, a lot of um, because of this uh, it was observed that uh, a rapid expansion of agriculture was also happened so far farmers started doing 
uh, uh, farming uh, started growing paddy in also summer summer season, and uh, which led to um, overuse of groundwater reserve and eventually the tributary lost connection with the main stem of the river. So dam have a cascade effect on riverine ha habitat, which is difficult to quantify and it cannot be uh, easily accounted for. So next we look into the degree of fragmentation um, index, which was derived from free from river data set. And if you look at um, most of the tributaries and most of the principal tributaries and the main stem of the river is highly fragmented, high, highly fragmented. The degree of fragmentation is basically a measure of fragmentation of rivers into stagnant river reaches due to presence of dams or water diversion structures. And this value generally ranges in between uh, zero to hundred percent, and it is a dominant factor affecting the longitudinal connectivity of river. So, as seen in this map, most of the rivers, the main main stem of the river, and also the principal tributaries, they are highly fragmented. And like if you look at Shimsha River, it has uh, like seventy five percent of its length is uh, fragmented. So. So in Kaveri River Basin, around 50% of the total river volume is impacted by regulated flows from reservoirs. And so this is the sediment trapping index. And this index overlap, this overlaps with the degree of fragmentation maps as both the pressures originate from dams or reservoirs built across the Kaveri River system. The main a stem and its principal tributaries have a high sediment trapping index, and sediments are trapped by dams on the river system, reducing the transport of sediments to the downs downstream regions. And this makes the riverbeds coarser and causes channel erosion and bank instability. And also, the aquatic organisms who make use of sediments for breeding or shelter, etc., also suffer because of reduced load of sediments from upstream areas. So, so because of these dams, there is a significant hydrological alterations in the Kaveri River Basin. Um, you can look at uh, these stations are arranged from uh, upstream to downstream location. So this is the upstream station, Kolegal, and this is the most downstream station, Musiri, at Musiri. And you can see how the red line depicts the natural flow regime, and this was derived from a global hydrological model called PCR Global data set. And the red and the blue line depicts the observed flow from Central Water Commission data set. And you can see there is a significant, uh, uh, significant departure from the natural flow regime. Um, the, a large reduction in blaze flow is observed at all the gauge locations located on the main stem of the river, which signals a high rate of water abstraction. And um, uh, as we go from upstream gauge station, Kolegal to the last gas station, Musiri, located near the delta region of the basin. And base flow in summer months drop to very low levels, almost like zero flow condition, while high flow high flows during monsoon seasons were also reduced and stabilized because of low regulations. So then uh, let's have a look at the fish species richness in the basin. You can see um, uh, uh, there are around 56 families of freshwater fishes with 146 genera uh, exist, existing in Kaveri River Basin. And like there are around very high fish species richness, around 122 to 218 species per catchment is found in upper catchments of Kaveri River Basin, located in southern western Ghats and also in the Delta region. But, uh, but um, if you look at the species of concerns, basically it's species which have IUCL status of Critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. They are mostly concentrated in the upstream uh, areas of the Kaveri River Basin, mainly in the Western Ghats. And uh, this is basically uh, this this is basically because of the uh, fragmentation caused by presence of dams in the upstream areas. And a number of Potadromus fish species are endangered and facing extinction in Kaveri River Basin. So let's have a look at those threatened migratory Potadromus fish species. Um, these Potadromus fish species generally uh, spend their life lifetime in uh, freshwater only. So they migrate from upstream to downstream areas in freshwater only. And um, 
if you look at uh, most of these species like tor malabrishis tor, tor rema delhi uh, the large migratory fish species who cover large distances um, they are now now they are considered as critically endangered and um, so a number of factors like as arya mentioned deforestation invasive species alteration of drainage basin condition fragmentation and regulation of rivers over extraction of groundwater pollution as well as climate change impact the fresh fresh water species in the basin and uh, if you look at uh, the spatial population range of some of these um, fish species uh, mainly from the genre of tor and hypsilobarbus which are endemic to this region um, they are overlaying in the areas which high with high fragmentation so to the, their population range is getting restricted due to um, presence of dams uh, in the uh, on the rivers and uh, tor rema devi a uh, humpback mahsi is an iconic freshwater species native to kaveri river basin and it was observed that they, they it is an estimate that the reduction of there is a reduction of 90% in the population range of tor rema devi and it is currently listed, listed as critically endangered by iucn and um, these spatial range were um, assessed um, in 2010 so this is not a very late latest data set and this was um, assessed during 2010 iucn assessment and um, so this now you can see how the degree of fragmentation uh, uh, impacts the population range of uh, these uh, migratory fish species in kaveri river basin in the end i want to conclude with a quote by jane goodall and she says she rightly says that every species has a role to play in the tapestry of life if you don't protect this biodiversity if you continue over consuming and wasting natural resources this tapestry will gradually fall apart Thank you very much, Saravi. That's fantastic. And um, I hope Kartik is still with us. And you can see this humpback marsier that was discreen there. And I guess in a minute we'll be talking a little bit more about that. I just wanted to ask you one thing, if I could, please, Saravi. You mentioned um, you showed your graphs of the flows at various monitoring stations throughout Kaveri and. Earlier on, you mentioned there's a lack of data and a lack of research into e-flows. So, how do we have a lack of data if we have that monitoring data from stations like that? Yeah, we do have uh, data of impacted flows, like the dams were built in 1960s and 70s, but uh, we started recording the flow data after the dams were built. So, we don't have an idea of what were the natural flows at the river. So, we need to. uh like get an idea of it through hydrological modeling using uh but the, these are not these models the hydrological models are not that accurate so it's just a guess work so yeah okay yes thank you that's a really a uh, valid point to make so much of what we're doing is still guess work so we saw that humpback marsier at the end there which uh, draws me they're one of the largest freshwater fish that lives in india so bhavna are you with us are you there and if you are can you explain why large fishes inhabit certain types of river habitat yeah uh, thank you steve thank you so much thank you uh, yeah uh, firstly i would like to thanks uh, surabhi and arya for Uh, they have discussed about the small fishes and the importance of river connectivity so uh, i would like to share my screen
Steve, uh, uh, is the presentation and uh, my screen is visible? I can see your main screen still. Okay, thank you so much. Then uh, I'll start with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, main, sorry, it's not the main screen of your presentation. It's uh, I can see inside your folder. It's not still open. Not but, at the uh, moment. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start again. Yeah. So we'll just try again to open up the presentation. There are still more questions coming in in the chat bar, which is good to see. I've made a note of a couple of them, so I certainly I've picked out one which should be getting answers from both Arya and Saravi. But we'll look at that after we've had Bhavna. Okay, your presentation is ready to roll. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. So I would like to start uh, with the picture uh, of marshes you all can see. Uh, these are the big uh, fish flowing in the Kosi River in uh, Ramnagar in Nainital. So with, uh, with this, I would uh, like to start. I don't know, it's not moving ahead. Yeah, it looks like it's not moving on. Yeah, yeah it's there, I think. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so as uh, Surabi has uh, beautifully mentioned about, uh, you know, the morphology of rivers that we know that rivers start flowing from its head sources and when coming towards downstream, uh, the ecology of river varies accordingly and uh, at the same time if we see the link between the microbiota that is present under these uh, big uh, freshwater system that also varies. So there are certain factors and there is a high degree of spatial and temporal uh, variation in at all scales of the use of mic mic micro habitats and the macro habitats by these different uh, organisms in the freshwater rivers. So uh, the, there are certain factors which actually affect the, the presence and the uh, use of microhabitats by these species. And they are uh, like the flow, which is very important for uh, every species to thrive in the rivers. Uh, like if we consider about the main uh, big fishes and we have different stream orders that flowing from the higher altitude to the lower altitudes, so we have uh, snow trout fishes, which actually prefer high turbulence in water with a very cold temperature towards. And then coming to, uh, down towards, we have catfishes, which usually prefer warm water in the plain areas. So uh, there are other factors which include uh, the nature of substratum avail uh, available in the river systems and the slope, what kind of physical chemical properties that vary accordingly, uh, the composition of the organisms that changes in the river systems. So uh, if we talk about more of the habitat types that we are having in the river systems, uh, we need to look for the morphology of the rivers. Then when the river starts from its head source, it comes downstream. So it, you know, it um, uh, get changes into different kinds of uh, uh, flow rates and the water column that gets changes. And there is a formation of different types of uh, mic uh, micro habitats there. And uh, for uh, for the, this type, you can uh, in the screen you can see there are riffle, run, and pool. And for the large fishes, we have uh, like in the study we have seen or majorly find that they prefer to thrive in the shallow uh, pools and the deep uh, with deep water pools. So with this, I would like to mention more about these macro habitats and what is the importance of these macro habitats for all, not only for the large species, but for all the other species that uh, Surabi has also mentioned about it. So I will be focusing more on the detail, like why, what, what is the importance and what are the main factors which we actually, uh, on the basis of we classify these macro habitats. So we have actually run riffle rapid cascade and other types of uh, macro habitats in the river systems and they vary accordingly uh, depending upon the flow rate, 
uh, depending upon the substratum exposed and the turbulence they have and kind of you know um, the hydraulic jumps of uh, water in the river system so accordingly runs have a very less velocity which is not more than uh, 0.2 meter per second comparative to riffle uh, which have uh, 0.2 to 0.5 meter per second the flow rate we mentioned accordingly the classified system and then we have rapid which have high flow and high turbulence rate and then the cascades which are also preferred by uh, living organisms in the uh, river systems and um, they are usually uh, uh, fall uh, kind of uh, water flowing from a certain height which is less than one meter so second we have a uh, substratum uh, that is the basic uh, you know the more important not only for the lard when fish becomes adult but also for the all its uh, its life history stages uh, for example if we consider a fish then we uh, if we consider fish and its complete life cycle then we have eggs we have uh, fry then fingerlings juvenile sub adults and then comes adults so every kind of stage is preferred and they use different kinds of substratum and macro habitats so uh, uh, according to the classification system we have classified on the basis of diameters uh, for the study we use this kind of availability present and the use of the fishes uh, uh, they are prefer what kind of uh, uh, substratum they prefer in the river their in their habitats so uh, come uh, uh, giving an importance of the habitat and the formation of habitat in the river systems we have large fishes and i will be talking more about first uh, the major indian carps were having everybody like uh, more uh, aware of uh, uh, the uh, three major carps we're having that they grow big in sizes and we have labio rohita is one of them which uh, uh, the, the size can be up to 45 kg and 2 meter in size that is the reported one and three other labio species I have mentioned here are the labio bata, labio calbasu and labio, uh, labio pangusia and uh, uh, here I would like to uh, focus more on the sizes of these fishes and because of that size and because of their ecology and role in the river system they have importance in uh, ecology of river and even in the aquaculture uh, uh, fish farming also so here uh, you can see the adult size of um, uh, kalbasu uh, can grow uh, uh, that is the reported one it's 91.2 centimeter till date so coming towards the other uh, major carps that is the katla and the mrigal fish we're having uh, here i would like to focus more on katla that it is a it actually shows a very fast uh, growth rate uh, in its size and it can grow up to like the reported one is 63 kg and uh, and the uh, mrigal is comparatively uh, small uh, and i would like to uh, highlight one point here that uh, all the carps and all other different species uh, that uh, surabi has mentioned about the feeding and the importance of the other uh, those small fishes for the large fishes in the uh, food web and the food chain that uh, how they are linked uh, towards each other so it's very important because uh, they are uh, like katla is a bottom dweller they usually feed on um, uh, vegetable matters or their uh, fingerlings usually feed on zoom plankton uh, same that a labio is a shallow water uh, uh, water column user so uh, there is a uh, you know a resource uh, used by uh, different species different large species of fresh water in the river systems so there are some other more uh, important cyprinid fishes that grow big in sizes and have its uh, role in the ecology uh, for example, we have Chagunias chagunia, and uh, the important it's like it's a, uh, like all uh, the carp fishes are important game and migratory uh, fishes uh, in the freshwater river systems. And uh, Chagunias uh, chagunia are um, you know they are different uh, by the having presence of the tubercles on their snout. They, they can distinct between the other species. And we have the Bangana diro that is a benthopelagic freshwater fish, and maximum reported size it's seventy five centimeter. Uh, now coming towards uh, like uh, the actually uh, the fishes which are known for their sizes and uh, big sizes actually. So we have the Mahashi species and we have three genera to cover that is the Nazitor and the Neo Neolizokylus and the top. So I have uh, here mentioned about three important fishes in the Himalayan freshwater systems that we found uh, majorly these uh, species. Uh, the importance of these species uh, is linked by ecological also religious viewpoint also and most importantly uh, they are like uh, you know delight for um, 
the anglers they usually prefer to uh, you know uh, um, uh, Uh, the powerful nature of this fish makes them so de uh, delightful for everyone uh, to uh, angle them and um, but uh, the importance uh, of the growth uh, if we see for tortor and torputitora uh, the rep uh, maximum reported size of tortor is 150 cm and for the torputitora it's 2.5 cm and which and the weight for is uh, 54 kg now uh, i would like to take you uh, the most important and most fascinating fish uh, which we found in india which have which can grow up to an enormous size and it's also known as a giant devil and a water monster that is the goonj uh, so uh, it can uh, grow up to a size of uh, and weight of like most uh, 140 kg around and the size can be more than 2 meters and these are actually the beast which are thriving in the himalayan river systems uh, from um, uh, the north part of the ramganga to the brahmaputra in arunachal pradesh here i would like to uh, i think everybody is quite aware of the personality here who is uh, quite renowned for its uh, extreme ang uh, you know angling tactics but uh, my focus of sharing these pictures is the size the size of the goonj that we are getting in the uh, fresh water systems you can see how much they big can grow and uh, here also i have uh, a picture of um, mahashir uh, that he is handling with it so uh, this is the importance like uh, of the uh, you know river systems that from very small uh, creature to the largest one they are uh, thri uh, you know inhibiting together and they, how they are linked together it's very important to uh, to study about the the ecological link uh, between all these species um, uh, together so now i will be sharing more about my favorite or the species i am working on that is the golden mahashir Uh, uh i would first like to mention about uh, like it is known as the king of freshwater fishes and it is the king uh, like tiger of the uh, it is known to be like you know uh, tiger of the tiger among the all the freshwater fishes its distribution is actually from uh, throughout the himalayan range from um, afghanistan to uh, uh, towards the north east uh, in Brahm brahmaputra river but uh, presently its uh, population is getting not uh, that is decline and we only found a uh, good population of golden marsh in some pockets uh, of the himalayan range uh, that i have already mentioned about its size that it can grow maximum uh, maximum reported it's uh, it's 2.575 meter and which can grow up to a 54 kg uh, by weight uh, it usually inhabits a cool water with a stony uh, substratum and uh, sandy pools so they prefer the mostly adults they prefer juveniles uh, they feed on planktons and uh, they are uh, adults are omnivore in nature the most important uh, you know behavior of uh, the uh, mahashir uh, uh, here i would like to mention about golden mahashir it's about uh, uh, its migration they migrate they are put autonomous in nature and they migrate uh, within uh, 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 the fresh water uh, streams uh, uh, the large size fishes they move up towards uh, the Uh, smaller order streams to uh, spawn there and come back uh, but now a days um, there are certain factors that already have mentioned in the earlier uh, presentations that uh, that are actually harmful and they are um, the number of fishes are getting decline uh, because and uh, because of these all these uh, you know um, aspects and uh, all these combined together uh, anthropogenic stresses over the fishes uh, the golden mahashir is endangered uh, among all the mahashis that we have uh, around 16 species of mahashis reported in india so here uh, i have mentioned about its uh, behavior of migration i would like to focus uh, its migration in uh the river ganges which is actually explained by a uh, well renowned personality who has more than 20 uh, years of more than 20 years of experience on mahashir behavior so he has mentioned about uh, the mahashir uh, migration in the ganga foothills and i have mentioned earlier that we have different uh, zones for it uh, like uh, the smaller order streams that are in the lower himalayas and uh, the middle stretch we can uh, like the alaknanda and bagirathi confluence point that is the dev prayag and they are then coming towards down that we have the lower himalayan stretch of uh, ganga river in haridwar and vishukesh so uh, during the time of march to 
june that is the pre monsoon season the uh, already uh, uh, present juveniles and adults they move upstream towards the middle stretches and the brooders they they have the time to come uh, down but when the monsoon begins and the marshy get triggers for the breeding uh, and the spawn to uh, to move up for spawning then there is a migration of uh, these uh, brooders from the lower uh, foothills uh, of um, himalayan region in the river ganga towards the higher uh, stream uh, 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 in the lower himalayas part and uh, the uh, brooders already present in the himalayan middle stretch also the, uh, they move upstream so comparatively all the, the big adult marshes they move upstream to spawn and uh, the juveniles after some time when the juveniles they uh, they uh, the when x get mature and they convert into fingerlings and juveniles and they come back downstream so this is the migration behavior uh, explained uh, for the ganges uh, in india uh, here i have mentioned a single slide of uh, a very small part uh, of my work that we are doing for the golden mahashir uh, here uh, that i have uh, mentioned about the importance of uh, habitat micro habitats and macro habitats and the use of uh, these habitats by the fish species uh, especially uh, if we talk about the uh, large fishes so uh, in kosi river in uh, ram uh, nagar in nainital we have uh, done a study Uh, for different seasons like uh, post winter post monsoon and pre monsoon and here i have i am mentioning about the uh, use of these um, uh, micro habitat used by the adults of the fishes so uh, adults of the golden marshy they usually prefer very less flow with having a deep uh, availability of water column so that they can thrive well and the substratum use uh, we have uh, uh, they use is the sand uh, uh, dominant uh, dominant uh, substratum is sand then covered by the cobbles and gravel and uh, bedrocks also and comparatively for the covariates there is a variation among season like uh, in the post winter water gets so clear so we have uh, like a uh, measured higher uh, do value for it and uh, that way it varies uh, differently so this is just a very uh, small uh, uh, result uh, just about the adults of marshy that how uh, the importance of uh, these micro habitats for all the living species is really important so uh, as uh, uh, in the earlier presentation we uh, the both the speakers have mentioned about the threats uh, the fishes are uh, these all river systems are uh, undergoing but yeah but this is the major concern that i am again will be talking about it and we need uh, uh, you know um, to look into because it's it's happening everywhere so uh, i will be showing uh, some pictures from uh, my field um, so you can have an idea that what kind of uh, Uh, you know um problems or uh, threats uh, the fishing uh, in the fishing uh, activities is there and they are posing threats for the fishing sur uh, fishing survival so firstly is the indiscriminating fishing and overfishing that is the basically uh here you can see a picture this picture is very normal to everyone like uh you know in the market the fishes are being sell uh but uh, i would like to mention here this is uh, a picture where uh, people have actually ordered fish from a fresh water system and at high rates i mean uh, they don't uh, want to buy fish which are commercially supplied but they want it from the uh, site and uh, for that purpose if uh, the fishermen are getting more prices for it uh, you know they are using any kind of means to kill the fish and sell in the market so this is a huge problem uh, which i have come across uh, during my study so here the it's a local person is using some method to kill fish and catch fish so that uh, one uh, you know uh, one meal can be <laughs> completed for uh, a day but these are really a problem because they are not going for uh, the what kind of size they are catching if there is a juvenile is a fingerling or it's a uh, breeding female so and uh, already mentioned about the uh, bleaching and the dynamiting so there here would, you can see the effects uh, it's not only the fishes which are going to affect but the whole uh, ecosystem whole water ecosystem is going to affect uh, from the smaller one to the larger species so and the effects of uh, can be seen for long that the quality of water uh, will remain uh, deteriorated for long time
in the habitat de uh, destruction that is the most common that the pollution is uh, doing and this picture is from uh, uh, the region code dwar in um, sunay and we can see there are a lot of fishes died because uh, the the water uh, the do level was so low and at the same time the all the fishes uh, we saw that all the fishes have died and then habitat destruction that is the major concern and that boulder and sand mining uh, and as i mentioned about the importance of substratum for the fishes at different uh, life uh, stages so if it will be like uh, you know uh, it will be uh, continuing then it will be uh, major problem for the fishes and also the people are constructing canals to for the irrigation purposes and all but there at the same time the sustain sustainable means uh, we have to think upon it also and uh, as i mentioned about the flow modification and divergence and this is a, a map uh, which is actually a study by the wildlife institute of india itself uh, in 2012 but uh, you can see here how many proposed uh, project plan and under construct, uh, construction projects and commission projects it just simply uh, uh, just to focus on if we see if our fish fishes are migratory in nature and they migrate to uh, spawn upstream so if there are barriers then uh, what uh, will be the you know there we have to uh, figure out like uh, what will be the new ways uh, and what will be the uh, you know routes for the migration of these species and as i mentioned earlier these uh, the spawning uh, behavior of marshy so if the conditions will remain same or you know if if we have if we uh, don't come across with a sustainable uh, use of uh, uh, these things so there will be no upstream uh, migration and no downstream migration will happen and uh, here uh, i would like to mention about like how the importance of uh, mahashir are there here in the picture itself the golden mahashir is explaining like actually it's flaunting like golden mahashir are 24 karat stuff but uh, other than the golden mahashir and other mahashis and including all the fishes uh, there is a, a need for you know whole connectivity of the river system that all uh, we are going through and uh, yeah if for the conservation if uh, we have to do something more and it will be a my, uh, nice move for us so with this i would like to end my presentation thank you thank you bhavna and um lots of questions coming in but interesting that you posed a question yourself in your presentation towards the end there where looking specifically at ganga and you said given the state of river connectivity what will be done for for migration of marsias So a question from you as well as the questions coming in from other people um and I just like to throw one quick question out there which came from Abdul who's asked a few questions already and he said that flow regulation leads to homogenization of habitats so how will this affect species with limited dispersal low reproduction and short life cycles So I think Arya touched on that already when she spoke about the gobies and how they're affected by removal of sand in their system. So I wonder Arya has does your comment about sand and the gobies does that cover what Abdul is asking there? Um how does removal of sand change flow regulation? Um basically uh, once you uh the you uh, mine the sand from these rivers what happens is that the sands become uh, the river become more deep and uh, the more uh, the sand is removed uh, you the sand is removed by mud and uh, other substrates and uh, <clears throat> gobies are usually uh, dwelling on the sand and their whole life cycle is dependent on these kind of uh, sand bottom or sand so once you remove them they have no habitat so technically i hope uh, that sums up everything about uh, if you are talking about the yeah, for about the sand yeah that's it so in this so specific instance where abdul was talking about homogenization of habitat 
there are impacts like the sand mining, which are actually completely destroying habitat. Exactly. And so, Sarabi, um, could you maybe answer the same question? So when Abdul is asking about flow regulation, which is probably more your subject being an engineer. So how does flow regulation affect those species? Do you have any insight into how it affects those species that have limited dispersal or those that have a low reproduction or low rates of reproduction or have a short life cycle? I think they'll get limited to a particular area and, and because of flow regulation, they'll not be able to complete the full life cycle and eventually they will be, the species will be critically endangered or extinct. So I think there is an, because of flow regulation, there's a lot of impact on the life cycle of the species, like also the there are also the these riparian plants which, um, like they have they the organic matter that goes into the river and all. So this organic supply to the fish species and that also get affected. Hey, thank you. So I guess I think uh, there there is something yeah, sorry, just talking about uh, the fish ladder, right? So uh, yeah, can we come on to that separately? And what just one yeah, second. So I just, if, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, sum up basically uh, what Surabi mentioned also, um, and referring back to Abdul's question that those fish that have low reproductive rates and short life cycles, limited dispersal, they're bound to be more vulnerable, I imagine, if we're looking at these fragmentations of rivers or removal of habitat which then leads on, as Aria was about to mention there, we had quite a few questions about, are fish ladders successful? Is one, so Sripana, who works with Marcia in Madhya Pradesh, she asked how successful are fish ladders? And Olik, who I've worked with in Arunachal Pradesh as well, she asked, are fish ladders the answer? Because we do need dams. So does anybody have any input onto fish ladders? And Arya, you're up on screen. Do you have, are you aware of any work done specifically on fish and fish ladders? Uh, actually, I wanted to, uh, I want to say, say a point which is uh, very significant uh, now because uh, the fish ladders might be really effective in Western countries because uh, the um, the, all the diversity that they may they might have will be salmons or uh, which almost all fishes will have a very very specific way of uh, moving so if you're uh, building fish ladders in a specific way almost all the fishes can move up or down but if when i'm talking about i i, I was talking about loaches uh, okay bhavna was talking about masir so in a very, when you consider one square kilometer, say, there are multiple kinds of uh, fishes which dwell on different habitats and they have a different way of moving. So uh, some fishes can't jump, some can jump, some can only glide. So uh, the effectiveness of fish ladder in such an ecosystem is very complex, I would say. <laughs> Yes, perfect. Um, Thank you. And uh, also, sorry, I'll come to you in a second, Surabi. And there's a, a comment from Sripana, which also echoes what I've seen, that in the Indian situation, fish ladders act as fish traps, and they just become a draw for locals who know the fish are migrating there, the big fish are there in huge numbers. It's easy to take those fish, which are the ones we want to do serve because they're the ones in breeding condition. So as Surabi, yes, you had some comments about fish ladders and dams? Yeah, I think apart from having these fish ladders, you also need to provide an optimal amount of water and the, uh, the flow for sediments. So that is also needed. And I think in high flow and low flow conditions, this migrations cannot happen. So I mean, they, so that's why the fish ladders become ineffective. Yes, perfect. Um, so again, a point I was going to make that fish ladders are only useful if there's water. And we did have a question which I'll direct to Bhavna in just a second, which was about 
Marcia, what we would call true Marcias, which are members of the genus Tor, and what we could call lesser Marcias, which are members of the genus Neolysochylus. And in my experience, they spawn completely the opposite seasons. The Marcia, the Tors I've seen spawning, spawn in the monsoon in high water levels, and Neolysochylus spawn in completely low water levels. So if you're designing a fish pass that can suit a fish to move in the highest monsoon spates and in the season when you're releasing no water from the dam, it's almost an impossible thing to try to fix. Um, I'd just say we may run out of time. We've already run over. We'll try to fit in another couple of questions, then we'll have to call a halt. But as I mentioned in the chat bar, we'll try to answer some of these questions in the Facebook group as well. So, um, Bhavna, the question was, and it came from, and I made a note of it, but I am going to have to scroll back up through here. Uh, our friend from Myanmar, from Tado, who said, what are the triggers for Marcia spawning? He's seen different populations of Neolysochylus strachii, which is a mainly Southeast Asian Neolysochylus Marcia, although there could be some populations in the far Northeast of India. So he said he's seen different populations of Neolysochylus strachii in Myanmar, where they both have successful uh, fry spawning, both in January and in August. So in your experience, Bhavna, what are triggers for Marcia spawning, whether Tor or Neolysochylus? Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you for the Yeah, uh, basic, uh, the triggers for the marsh uh, if I focus on golden marsh in the Himalayan rivers, what triggers they get? Uh, when the monsoon and, you know, when the rainfall starts and the turbidity of river gets more, they get more turbid and the flow of the river gets uh, high, that uh, the flow rate is quite high and velocity is more, that gives the trigger towards the adult species to uh, move, uh, you know, against the flow of the river systems to find uh, the crevices in the, on the banks of the rivers to uh, lay eggs there and uh, 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 kind of this, this spawn there. Uh, for the ne uh, neolysochylus, uh, I am not uh, much uh, clear about, uh, you know, um, if uh, the, they affected by the same uh, triggers by the monsoon as we have seen in the Himalayan river systems. So basically, uh, if we talk about migration uh, in the uh, Mahashe, it's not only for the spawning. Uh, they migrate uh, during different seasons also for the feeding purposes and, uh, you know, for uh, different resources and kind of uh, uh, habitat uh, 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 cover uh, for this, uh, they migrate upstream. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, I, I won't be able to, uh, you know, complete uh, 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 for uh, the neo uh, Neolysochylus species, but I'm sure for the Himalayan species that they get triggered for the spawning uh, during the monsoon season. And the, for the seeds, you can see for the eggs and the juveniles, for the all over year, you can see those, uh, the presence of the, those seeds, juveniles and fingerlings uh, in the higher order streams there. Okay, thank you. And um, I'll draw to a close. There are still more questions. We'll keep a tab of those questions, as I mentioned. And to bring back to what Bhavna was just saying and what Surabi explained to us about connectivity, that we are thinking of large fishes migrating for spawning. But fish move for far more reasons than simply for spawning. So we have to consider fish ladders or fragmentation in those frameworks also. And we had a very good comment in the chat bar. I did mention that we had a visitor from the US with us. So David Phillip, who's a good friend, who's worked on Golden Marcia across a large part of the Himalayan range, specifically in Bhutan, where they did a telemetry project. So tagging the Marcia to see how they move, where they move, etc. And David has seen, for those people who've not seen the comment, that Fish ladders generally are designed to allow fish to migrate upstream to spawn. And they don't take into consideration the downstream migration for the fish to get back. And also for the juvenile spawn to go back down the river to reach what would be their home territories. So there's obviously a lot that we need to think about when we're looking at fish and how they use, hopefully, a connected river habitat. 
All it remains for me to say is that across these three days so far, we've seen how river habitats are varied and complex mixes of biological, chemical and physical relationships. Tomorrow, we'll be looking at reptiles and geology. Don't forget to log on to our pages. So you can join us on Twitter, you can join us on Facebook, and um, hopefully you'll join us live here on Zoom or on our YouTube channel as well. From me and from my three expert star speakers today, thank you very much. And on behalf of the whole life team, it's goodbye until tomorrow. <laughs>